He is risen. He is risen indeed. It is Resurrection Sunday, and we want to welcome you to this very special edition of the virtual worship here at Brighton United Methodist Church. We are so grateful that you're choosing to take some time on this Resurrection Sunday to celebrate and to gather in worship with us here at the church. We want to welcome you, whether you're watching this video in the morning, in the evening, or in the middle of the day. We are so glad you have joined us. We want to welcome and praise God together. You have journeyed with us throughout this holy week, and now we're here. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. We want to make sure that you're remaining connected with us here at the church, and that begins by sending you over to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com, where you can catch up on all of the latest information about our ministries and how you can remain plugged in there. You can get our uh, broadcaster newsletter. You can look at our calendar. You can check in with everything that you'll need to know. We also want to invite you to find us over on Facebook. There you can continue connecting with us uh, Monday through Friday at noon for the midday prayer break. You can get all of the information about upcoming events, including the continuation of our virtual Bible study Tuesday mornings at 9 o'clock on Zoom. In fact, you can get all of the information and the inspiration that you will need to get through your week with us together. Now, as we are invited into the atmosphere of Resurrection Sunday worship, we are invited there through the words of Psalm 118. We'll read verses 1 and 2 and 14 through 24. Let us hear the word of the Lord together. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Friends, the Lord is truly our strength and our might. He has become, through the cross, and now the empty grave, our salvation. We gather together, the body of Christ, to celebrate the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The grave could not hold him, and neither can the church. We must go and celebrate in all the world that Jesus Christ has risen this day. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we stand before you in awe of your awesome power and might, your love for us that saw your Son hanging upon the cross, and Lord, we rejoice that the morning has come, that dawn is here, that resurrection is our reality. Lord, we pray that you would come and meet us in this place, that you would fill our hearts, that they might be strangely warmed, that you would fill our minds, that we might be truly inspired. That once again, Lord, you would take hold of our lives and transform us to your glory this day and forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.
Well, we've come to that time in our service where we would invite the children down front for a moment of message around our friend here, God's Mystery Box. Today, I have a very special mystery box for you today. If you will look inside our friend here, the mystery box is empty. Now, this happens from time to time. And unfortunately, since we have not been able to do a live children's mystery box for over a year, it's been happening, uh, well, for a year. You have been gracious in sending me your pictures, and I want to encourage you to continue sending me your pictures that they might end up here in our virtual mystery box. But when we would do the mystery box in person, sometimes the child would forget to bring something, and so the box would be empty. Well, it just so happens that the perfect children's message about an empty mystery box can be a part of Resurrection Sunday. To help, to help you understand what I mean, I want you to look at this beautiful panel. This is one of my favorite windows in the whole church. You can see there's a, an angel sitting out in front of a big rock. But what is this a part of? Remember, all of these windows tell stories from the Bible, and this one is my favorite because this one tells the story of the empty tomb. That's right. When the women come to, to uh, take care of Jesus' dead body that's been laid in the tomb on Friday, what they discover is an angel and the empty tomb telling them that Jesus has risen from the dead, just as he said he would. And so you see, sometimes we are disappointed when nothing is there, or the thing we thought was there is missing. Just like when we go to open our mystery box and it happens to be empty. But you see, sometimes it's the best news of all when we discover the empty tomb. Do you know why? Well, because Jesus died to forgive our sins and he rose that we might have life forever. That we might live forever. And he gives us that gift. Jesus is the first to rise from the dead for all eternity. It's so very special. And that is what we celebrate on Resurrection Sunday. This is a big day. And so, the next time you go looking for something and you can't find it, the next time you open a package and it's empty, the next time you can't find what you're looking for, I want you to take a moment and stop. And I want you to think about how those women went looking for Jesus' body and found the empty tomb. Sometimes, that can be the greatest news ever. Now, if you would like to help me with future mystery boxes here on the virtual worship, it's as easy as looking around your own room, your house, um, outside in your yard, anything at all. Take a picture of it and email it to me at revkershaw at gmail.com. And then you stay tuned to future virtual worships and see when your entry just might appear in our virtual mystery box, okay? All right, let us pray. God, we thank you that the tomb was empty. We thank you that Jesus rose from the dead. We thank you that you give us new life. Lord, we thank you because you loved us that much. We thank you for the love you share with us each and every day, but especially for the love you share through these beautiful children in Jesus' mighty name we give you praise. Amen. We come to a time of prayer together on this Resurrection Sunday, and we want to invite you, if you have a joy or a concern that is weighing on you, that you would like to lift up in the body of Christ, we invite you to take advantage of our prayer email address at Brighton 
umcprayers at gmail.com. When you send in your prayer requests there, they come directly to me. And when they do, I lift them up in prayer, and then I send them along to our prayer warriors that we might keep you in prayer throughout this week. Please give us the privilege of praying with you and praying for you. Together, we will contend for your breakthrough in the mighty name of Jesus. And now, friends, we gather together as the body of Christ to offer a prayer for this Resurrection Sunday. Let us pray. O God, our Father in heaven, we consecrate ourselves anew to you this Resurrection Day. Grant us loyalty to your church and gladness in your service. Fill us with the spirit of reverence and humility that we are permitted to sing your praises. Keep us in the blessed remembrance that we are your children and in your presence and make us faithful in our duty and worthy of your love. O God, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection have delivered us from the power of our enemy, grant us to die daily from sin, that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. We join our hearts together in praying the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, friends. We have the privilege of declaring our faith as we join together in the Apostles' Creed. Would you join me? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and of earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
good morning and happy Easter. My name is Becky McCauley and I will be reading two scriptures today. The first one is from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of the of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. The second scripture is from Mark 16, 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on, on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was a very large stone. And centering, entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified, he has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as, as he told you. And they went out and they fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, grace be yours and peace from Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, we began this Lenten season with the challenge for each and every one of us to read the Gospel of Mark one chapter a day, one chapter a day without skipping. And if you missed, you had to go back and start over again. Several of you have shared with me that you, you've become very familiar with the first couple of chapters of Mark's gospel. But I pray that by now you have made it all the way through the gospel of Mark and that you, uh, you have discovered one of the most fascinating, one of the most striking features of this gospel. And that is, that is the ending. The ending of Mark's gospel is like truly no other gospel. It ends with the words that we heard Becky read for us today. Most of the, of the versions that we have add in some other stuff, but if you look carefully at your Bible, what you'll find is that most of them have little footnotes. Anything from from chapter uh, 16, verse 9, through anything all the way up through verse 20, we'll have a footnote that says these verses are not included in the earliest versions of the gospel that we have. Now, the suspicion is that 
Mark intended to end his gospel with the sending of the women from the empty tomb to go and tell the disciples and Peter to meet him in Galilee. But others read other gospels and thought, well, that, that seems like kind of a, an abrupt ending. But what if the gospel writer was intentional? What if the Holy Spirit's inspiration really was to end the gospel of Mark abruptly? as it does in verse 8. Now, I was having fun with the sermon title today. I don't know if you saw it across the, the bottom here, but in case you missed it, and in case you, you were refilling your coffee or, or distracted or, or not reading the banner, the, the title of today's sermon is Rolling Stones. That's right, Rolling Stones. And we're not talking about the rock and roll band. We're talking about rolling stones because of what caught my attention as I read Mark's account, this brief account of that blessed morning. If we dive into the Word, I hope you're, you've got your Bible handy, and I want you to look with me at a copy of God's Word into Mark chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. It says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. This is Jesus in the tomb. He's dead, they think. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, so right about now, right? They went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Who will roll the stone away for us? Right? These, these women are going. The, the, the stone is quite large. They, they witnessed where Joseph of Arimathea placed the body of Jesus after the crucifixion. And they were witness to the large stone that was rolled in front of the opening. And as they've bought their spices and they set out at dawn, really, uh, the first opportunity, because they had to go and rest on the Sabbath as they were instructed by the Lord. And so they were coming now to anoint the body of Jesus with the spices that they had purchased. And as they're going, they're thinking to themselves. They're talking among themselves. Who's going to roll the stone away? I mean, yeah, we've got these spices. Yes, we have the best of intentions. But who's going to roll this big rock out of our way so that we can get at the body of Jesus and anoint him and honor him in the way that he deserves? First of all, it's important for us to remember who these women are, who these women are. These women were not just random bystanders. These women were with Jesus in Galilee. They were a part, an integral part of his ministry, as important to his ministry as the disciples ever were. And we know this because of, well, chapter 15, frankly. If you were joining us for any version of the Good Friday service a couple of days ago, you, you heard these words in chapter 15, starting in verse 40. It says, there were also women. This is after the death of Jesus and before the burial. It says, there were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and Joseph and Salome. These are the same women witnessed to the crucifixion the disciples, well, they've scattered. Where are they? God only knows. But there were these women who had followed them, who were a part of their ministry. Now check this out. These women, they used to follow Jesus and provide for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. So you see, these, these women were sort of the support staff. They were the, they were the caretakers. They were the making sure that there was food for the people following. And they were the ones who were, who were tending to the needs and, and are making the, they were doing all of the background stuff, right? They were a part of the ministry. They were engaged. That's why these are the women, not the disciples who deserted, not Peter who denied, not Judas who betrayed, these women are the ones who are watching the crucifixion from a distance. These are the ones who see where Joseph of Arimathea placed the body. These are the ones who buy the spices and set out at dawn, wondering who will roll the stone away for them. 
Now Jesus, of course, these women are with him in Galilee. Jesus, in his ministry in Galilee and leading up to their journey to Jerusalem, where Jesus is crucified, they have heard Jesus predict his own death. Jesus repeatedly predicts his death. It begins, we've, we've heard it as we've read through the gospel, as we've gone through the lectionary. All the way back in chapter 8, Jesus first predicts the crucifixion. We had a sermon on this a few weeks ago. When Jesus first does it, right, he asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter gets the answer to the pop quiz right. You are the Messiah, the Son of God, right? You are the Messiah, the Son of God. And, and then Jesus begins to tell them, right? In verse 31, he says, he began to teach them that the Son of Man, that's himself, must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. After three days, rise again. He does it again in the next chapter. Finally, he does it a third time in chapter 10 as they're uh, preparing to make their final uh, uh, their final push to Jerusalem. In chapter 10, verse 33, Jesus says, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. Remember, these women traveled with him from Galilee. They, they were in Galilee. They traveled with him, with many others, up to Jerusalem. See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man, myself, right, Jesus, will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then he will be handed over to the Gentiles. We're getting more detail. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. Striking detail, right? And after three days, three days, he will rise again. These women were present. I can't imagine a scenario where these women weren't a part of hearing these predictions on the way to Jerusalem as they follow Jesus in Galilee. And guess what? Jesus not only predicts his death, he says on third day he will rise again. He will be killed, and on the third day he will rise again. Guess what? This is the third day. That's right. This is the third day. This would have been the day, if they had been paying attention to Jesus' predictions, that he would rise again. They had to have known about these predictions, yet they came not to see if the predictions were right, not to observe the resurrection out of faith, but they came to anoint the body of their fallen leader, their rabbi, the one they thought was Messiah. They came to anoint a body. They are trying to do the right thing, for sure. They are trying to do right by their leader, the one that they cared for, the one that they followed. They are wondering about this obstacle to their doing the right thing. This, this large stone in the way is going to prevent them from doing the right thing. Who will help us to roll this stone away? All the while, missing the big thing that has just happened. The big thing that Jesus spent many months predicting and has now come to reality. The question is, how often is this us? How often is the story of these, of these women, how often is that our story, do you think? Can you relate to that reality, that, that sense of trying to do the right thing, but staring at the obstacles in the way, wondering who's going to help with the obstacles? and missing the big thing that God is doing? I don't have to be the one to tell you that uh, Holy Week and the, the week leading up to the Resurrection Sunday, the, the big, it's like the Super Bowl for pastors, right? This is, the, this is the big week, right? Christmas is a big deal, but let me tell you, Holy Week and Resurrection Sunday are it. They are the biggest deal. In the whole year, the busiest week. My wife will tell you, this is the busiest week for a pastor. And there's so much to do, especially in a year of pandemic where I'm preaching to my phone. And Sunday I'll be preaching to 
I'll be preaching to live people, so we're double duty, trying to reach everybody, whether they have to stay home or they're not comfortable or whether they can come in person or everywhere in between. We're trying to do all that we can, so it's added to the craziness, and there seems to be no end to things to do. I need to meet with musicians. I need to practice music. I need to write sermons. I need to plan worship orders. I need to edit videos, and all the while try to keep in mind the big thing. And yet, it is so easy, even for a pastor, even focused like a laser on all that's going on in the Gospels and all that this Uh, season of Lent and culmination in Holy Week and Resurrection Sunday mean, it is so easy, so easy to be staring at those things in the way. Staring at the to-do list, staring at the never-ending pile of things that need to get done. It is so easy to be looking at the obstacles and miss the big thing that God is doing. No matter the obstacles we face in life, the loss of a job, the breakdown of a marriage, a fight with our family, the death of our loved ones, no matter what we face as a society, political fighting and racial tensions and mass shootings and civil unrest and global pandemics, No matter what we face as a church, denominational infighting and cultural apathy and persecution and marginalization and betrayal. No matter how big that stone may be, to focus on it is to be distracted by our problems instead of experiencing God's solution. No matter how big that stone may be. Can you picture it in your mind? Can you imagine what I'm talking about in your life? No matter how big that stone may be, to focus on it is to be distracted by our problems instead of experiencing in awe of God's solution. The Corinthians were busy rolling stones. That's right. The Corinthian church was uh, sort of a, a test project for Paul and his patience and for the power of the gospel, right? And the Corinthians were very busy rolling their own stones, focusing on their problems. And Paul, as we heard in this passage assigned for today, Paul in chapter 15, he's, he's wanting to ground them. And through them, through their letters, the Holy Spirit seeks to ground us, not in our problems, but in God's solution. Hear what Paul writes to the Corinthians. Now I would remind you in chapter 15, verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you. Bringing us back to basics, right? Which you in turn received in which you also stand, through which you also are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. Did you hear what Paul said? It is the good news, right? The good news is shorthand for the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the grace offered through that moment in history to all of humanity, right? The good news, the good news that Paul delivered to them and now in his letter reminds them, right? I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed by Paul, proclaimed to you, which you in turn received, in which you now stand, through which you are being saved continually. That's being there is a continually, you are being continually saved through the good news. It is the good news in which you stand and through which you are being saved. Now, Paul doesn't leave to chance, and thank goodness for that, for the Corinthian church and for us today. He doesn't leave the definition of the good news to chance. What is the good news? Well, Paul's going to tell us, for I hand it on to you, in verse 3, 
as of first importance. Remember, this is of first importance, which I in turn had received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. And then he appeared to James, and then the apostles, and to all the apostles. Right? He outlines this, this good news that is delivered. He, he outlines it as Christ died according to the scriptures, he was buried in the tomb, and on the third day he rose according to scripture, And he appeared to Peter and the twelve and five hundred and all of the apostles. And he is testifying to you, right? This is the good news. The good news is that Christ died. Christ is risen. And as we, of course, know, Christ will come again. The good news. This is of first importance, Paul says. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, that sounds great, but that was nearly 2,000 years ago. It seems so far away. It seems so distant from us, right? These events in history happened nearly 2,000 years ago, yes. But Paul reminds us with a little self-deprecation after he outlines that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, and the twelve, and the five hundred, and all of the apostles, right? Then in verse 8 it says, Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me, Paul. As one untimely born. As one untimely born. What does Paul mean by that? Well, Paul means that he was not able to follow Jesus when Jesus walked the earth. He was not among the twelve who witnessed all that Jesus did in Galilee, who followed him to Jerusalem, who scattered at his arrest, who cowered in fear at his crucifixion, but who received the presence of Jesus risen from the dead prior to his ascension. Paul comes to faith after Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Paul comes to faith only after all of the good news has been proclaimed for the first time. And so he refers to himself as one untimely born. Because, you see, it doesn't matter how long ago it happened. The good news, you see, is as fresh and as powerful and as life-giving and as soul-saving as it has ever been. And the world needs it now just as much as it did when it was first proclaimed. Paul refers to himself as one untimely born because he did not follow Jesus as the other apostles did during his earthly ministry. Yet Paul has the greatest legacy of all the apostles. Think about Paul, right? Peter may be the rock on which the church is built, but Paul's ministry is the one that fills it. It is Paul's ministry that opens up the church to the Gentiles. It is Paul's ministry that paves the way for the explosive growth in the followers of Jesus. Paul may be one untimely born, but God is going to use the untimely born to transform the world. It is Paul who authors more than half the New Testament. Look it up. Paul in his letters, in his cultivating Faith in the communities that he touches. Those letters become more than half of our New Testament, instructing Christians for more than 2,000 years, for almost 2,000 years, that is. Just because we may be late to the program 
Just because it might have happened 2,000 years ago doesn't mean that God is not ready to do great things through us. Remember, Paul says the good news that I that he proclaims to them in which you received, in which you stand and through which also you are being saved. God will use to transform the world even today, even nearly 2000 years later. But you also may be thinking, I've done some pretty awful stuff. I've done some pretty awful stuff. I don't know if God could use me. I don't know if this grace stuff applies to me. I don't know if this good news is truly good enough for all the bad that I've done. My past is my biggest stone, you might be thinking, right? And how am I going to roll away that stone? Who is going to help me roll away the stone of my past? Who will help me roll it away? Well, first of all, I want you to consider the story of Peter. And a detail you probably overlooked as we read this passage from Mark's ending to the gospel. The women come and they find the stone rolled away and they go and they find the the man dressed in all white and he tells them that Jesus is risen, right? The young man dressed in white robes sitting on the right side, they were alarmed, it says, but he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. And here's his instruction. Are you ready for this? But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Now, it's subtle. It is. It's subtle. But this young man dressed in brilliant white robes and instructing them, about the resurrection, he gives them this challenge. Go and tell the disciples and Peter. You have to remember, right, that Peter was sort of the hot head of the group. He's the one who gets the pot quiz right back in chapter 8, right? You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. But he's also the one who rebukes Jesus and hears the harsh words, get behind me, Satan. He's the one who... When Jesus says, you will all betray me, you will all desert me. Peter, being the hothead that he is, says, there's no way I will desert you, Lord. Even unto death, I will never desert you. And Jesus says, you will deny me three times. No way, he says, there's no way I will deny you. And yet, just hours later, after falling asleep repeatedly, while Jesus prayed, he denies him three times. And then we come to the instruction from this young man dressed in white robes. And he says, go and tell the disciples and Peter. Now, you and I might be thinking to ourselves, isn't Peter a disciple? Isn't Peter referred to among the 12 every time the 12 is listed? Yes, he is. Isn't Peter among the disciples who gathered with Jesus at that last supper and received the, the cup and the bread? Yes, he is. Isn't this the same Peter who has his feet washed by Jesus at the table? Yes. Yes, it is. And this is the same Peter who denies him three times. Denies him three times. It's a small detail, but remember, I like to say that the details in the gospel are not accidents. If there's a detail, it must be there for a reason. For this messenger to say, go and tell the disciples and Peter, is to imply that Peter is not implied in disciples. Now, you might say he wants to specifically make sure that Peter hears, right? But it could be that Peter's denial has put him outside the definition of disciple for an ever brief time. 
It's a reminder of Peter's betrayal. As I said on Friday, we focus on the betrayal of Judas, but every one of those disciples abandons Jesus. Every one of those disciples betrays him in their own way. And Peter, Peter in his very special way, Go tell the disciples and Peter. And yet, and yet, you are the rock. And on this church, or on this rock, Christ builds his church. God uses Peter in amazing and miraculous ways, despite his three denials. Still not convinced? Still thinking maybe you're a... Uh, you're a little too bad to receive the good news. The good news isn't good enough for your bad stone that needs to be rolled away. Well, just think about Paul himself. Just think about Paul himself. You know Paul? Paul himself was once Saul, the fearsome persecutor of the Christians who becomes the great apostle, the author of the New Testament, right? The filler of the church. But Paul is quick to remind us of who he was. And we can hear his own stone in his way, right? As we get into verse 9, it says, For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul is saying, I'm the least among the apostles. In fact, I don't even deserve to be an apostle because I persecuted God's church. I persecuted the followers of Jesus. What right do I have to lead them? You can hear he's got a stone. There's a stone in Paul's way, but Paul knows it's not his to move. Yes, there are many stones in our way, blocking our progress forward. And, and when we focus on them, they can consume us. When we focus on our problems, they can by, for sure, consume us. But this Resurrection Sunday, I want to suggest to you that those stones have been rolled away. They have been rolled away by the grace of God. Whatever challenge you face, whatever obstacle is in your way, whatever sin you've committed, whatever struggle and persecution you may face, the stone has been rolled away, not by our hands, but by the grace of God. After Paul admits that he is unfit to be an apostle, right? Because he persecuted the church, he reminds us of why God is able to use him. In verse 10, he says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. Amen, right? On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Paul says it's the grace of God. It's the grace of God that spurs him on to work harder and harder. But it's the grace of God that does it. It's not him who rolls the stone of his persecution away. It is not him who casts off the stone of his past. It is the grace of God that rolls that stone away. If we allow ourselves to be preoccupied with rolling our own stones, we will lose sight of the grace of God at work in our lives. We will try to do it ourselves, and God will get out of our way and allow us to try. But it is never too late. It is never too late. We are never too lost. God's grace is never in vain. And when your stone seems too big. I want you to recall these women. I want you to recall these women on the way to the tomb, wondering who will roll the stone away, only to discover that God already had. Friends, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Are you ready for your resurrection homework?
I hope you are. I hope you're prepared to do your homework because, you see, we're not about the theoretical here, not even on Resurrection Sunday. We are about the practical. So we want you to be able to take what we've been talking about here in our message and put it into practice in your everyday life. And that begins with the Thirsty 30. Remember, that's 10 minutes of Bible reading, 10 minutes of prayer, 10 minutes of worship, 30 minutes to God each and every day. Set your goal. Make it happen. 30 minutes to God each and every day. And while you're in the midst of that Thirsty 30 this week, I want you to come to God in prayer and ask God to reveal to you what stones are you rolling right now? What obstacles are you focused on? And then I want you to remember the women and try focusing on God's grace instead and see what happens. Okay? What stones are you rolling? And try focusing on God's grace instead and see what happens. Now, you may have been inspired. You may have heard the words of Paul. You may have been blessed by the Holy Spirit moving through my feeble words this Resurrection Sunday. You may have been journeying with us through this whole season, or you may have just jumped on for the very first time. But you're feeling that nudge. You're feeling that pull. You're feeling that prevenient grace, we call it, of God, that grace offered to all of us as that amazing gift of new life. And you may be thinking, I've never dared give my life to God in Christ Jesus. I want to be able to trust God with the stones of my past, the sins that hold me back. And I want to embrace that new life in Christ. If that's you, I want you to consider today giving your life to Christ. Not after the service, not later on today, not sometime next week, right now. Humble yourself before the Lord. Ask God for forgiveness. Embrace the grace that God has already offered you. Look beyond the stones of your life to the grace that God gives to deal with all your stones. I also know that there are times in the life of all of God's faithful where we sometimes stray, we find ourselves lost, we feel ourselves not as close to God as we want to be. And maybe the words of this message, maybe the words of of the scriptures today have touched your heart in a way that is drawing you back home, like the prodigal son. And I want to just invite you to lean into that, to dedicate yourself once again, to rededicate yourself to living a life faithful to God in Christ Jesus. Repent. Confess and repent of your sins and your falling short of your straying from the fold and come back to the good shepherd. Be embraced by the loving Father. Renew your faith in Christ. If you would like help knowing how to proceed, if you've been praying that prayer of new faith or praying that prayer of renewed faith, I want you to reach out to us. Get connected with us here in the community of faith. It's not enough to do it on your own. It's so important to get plugged into the fellowship. And so reach out to me at revkershaw at gmail.com and I will do everything in my power to connect you with people of faith who can come alongside you and nurture and grow and spur you on to greater and greater holiness. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we come before you in awe of the cross. Amazed at the empty tomb. Overwhelmed by your gift of amazing grace, O oh Lord. Lord, give us the courage to look beyond the stones of challenge in our lives. To see that you've already dealt with it. You've already overcome it. 
that your love and your grace have overcome even the grave. Help us to embrace the new life that you offer us in Jesus Christ, a new, a fresh, forever. We pray this in Jesus' mighty and powerful and precious name. Amen. It is on Resurrection Sunday that we become more aware than most days of all that God has given to us. We're fond of saying that God entrusts everything we have into our care and calls us to be good stewards. But the truth is, on Resurrection Sunday, all that God has given us takes on a new meaning. Christ died. God sacrificed his only begotten son that you and I might have the gift of life. That we might receive the grace of God and that we might join the kingdom of God. Declaring the good news. Taking that good news to the ends of the earth. We do that in part through the generosity of your giving. God calls us to be generous givers, not because God has need of our gifts, but because God knows we have need to cultivate generosity. As we bask in the glow of God's generosity, let us give generously to him. If you would like to contribute to God's ministries through this Brighton United Methodist Church, You can do so in a couple of ways. First of all, you can send us your donation by the mail. We do, in fact, get the mail. You can log on to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com forward slash donate and make your donation there. Or you can set it up with your financial institution to send us your contribution automatically. However you do it, we want to thank you for your generous support of our ministries, and we want to continue to encourage that support as we go about building the kingdom of God in this place and beyond. Now, if you find yourself in financial need during this season, perhaps you've lost your job or had your hours cut, maybe you find yourself in the midst of a financial crisis and could use some help. We here at the church have an emergency assistance fund, and we would like to do what we can to help you. All you have to do is send us an email letting us know of your need, to our prayer email address at brightonumcprayers at gmail.com. Let us know how we can help you. Don't let shame or pride get in your way. Don't let embarrassment hold you back. Reach out. Allow us, your church family, to help you in your hour of need. And now, friends, let us give generously to God. Thank mm-hmm. you. say 
But you will see that you were wrong. Go ahead, try to hide the sun, but all will see. Gracious and loving God, you have given us the gift of your son. You have given us the gift of your grace. You have given us all that we have. Lord, we give back a portion from your gifts that they might go out into the world and share the good news that he is risen. He is risen indeed. Lord, bless these our gifts that the good news might be spread throughout this land beginning with us. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. from the worship of this place to the worship of our everyday lives, may you go to face those stones rolled away by the Lord. May you go into the world declaring that He is risen. He is risen indeed. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Earth cannot keep its prey. Jesus.